I thought I'd close this with the idea of where we began, with what does it mean when we say learning without borders? And learning without borders can mean so many things to so many different people. And so over the last couple days, as I've reflected on this, the one border that I keep coming back to is this one, the borders of our classroom. When we talk about learning without borders, what does that mean in 2015 when we still have borders that confine us to a space? And even not even just a space, but space and time. That if you have a student in first period, they happen to be in your class at that time and that space. And for years now, we've been stuck in a system where we weren't allowed to get outside of these borders. What technology has allowed us to do is to truly transform that learning landscape. And we have to understand that everything is coming together at, at the right time. According to the UN right now, almost 20, uh, half the world's population is under the age of 25. Half the world's population is under the age of 25, according to the UN. There are over six billion people who have access to a cell phone. Six billion people have access to a cell phone. Only 4.5 billion people have access to a toilet. We have people who have more access, we have access to information more than we have access to clean sanitary conditions. What does that mean for this world? What does it mean when I have seen throughout the last three days that you have been Skyping or FaceTiming your families back home? And so children today are growing up understanding this idea of a connection. That your children that you are Skyping, you are teaching them that the communication signal, no matter where you are in the world, is always going to be there. And it's incredible until they hit this age and we see this. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, it's not good. Why is it when we see this, after we have raised them to understand the connection, we say, don't be social. Don't be connected. After we've taught them and they've grown up in a world that has been connected. And then they get older and again, we think it's cool. <laughs> So why is it okay to be connected when you're this age, connected when you're younger, but for some reason in the middle of your learning, it's not okay? What does it mean for a world where half the world's population is under the age of 25, has always grown up with technology, and where do we go with that? And I think there's a couple things we need to remember. We need to understand that this generation learns different than we do. And it's not right or wrong, it's different. And we need to be okay with that. See, our generations learn through process and procedure. We like our processes and procedures. We like to be told what to do. We like to make sure that there's a clear outcome. Just tell me what, there, what I need to do for an A, and I will do that. We love that, right? We love our processes and procedures. More and more research is showing, though, that if you grow up in a digitally connected world where you've always had access to information, that your brain is starting to be wired to learn through chaos and discovery. What does it mean to our educational system that has been built for years on the idea of process and procedure when the students who are coming to that system learn through chaos and discovery? And we have to think different. We have to understand that they believe that learning should be just in time. The biggest problem we have with this generation right now is that they've grown up understanding that you learn things the moment you need to know it. Who here has learned something by watching a YouTube video? So what you're telling me is, is it's the greatest educational network ever created by mankind. Turn and talk to the person next to you. What is something that you have learned by watching a YouTube video? Right now, quick. Okay. All right. Now, I want you to think about this. Anything and everything you probably shared 
has to do with something you needed to know the moment you needed to know it. Society has already made the shift outside of education that you can learn the moment you need something. The idea of having access to the World Wide Web is the idea that this generation has always just understood that you learn stuff when you need to know it, not because you need to know it for Friday's test, but that you learn it right now. How, what is it like to work in a system that was built on the idea that whatever you learned in school was all you could learn in life, right? When this system was built in the early 1900s, everything we could teach you, we had to teach you everything just in case you might need to use it later. And all of a sudden, that's no longer the case. My, my grandfather dropped out at eighth grade. Whatever, whatever he was taught by eighth grade, everything else after that was life experience. Today, we all live in a world where you learn it when you need to know it. One of my favorites, driving down the freeway the other day, car pulled off to the side of the road, legs sticking out from underneath the car, and a woman standing there like this. He's learning to change a flat tire now. <laughs> because now he needs to know how to change a flat tire. You need to fix your washing machine, you learn to do it now. How do we change the educational system to understand that we live in a time where you learn in the moment? And how do we structure classrooms so that we can take advantage of that? This generation also understands that information is always updated. Why in the world do we tell them to not use the most updated site that we have available today? I mean, forget about the accuracy thing. As soon as news breaks, there are more resources vetted through this one website than there are any other on any number of topics. They've never, they don't know that encyclopedias come in sets of 26 or 27. They have no idea that the O, remember when O and P were like split between two books? They don't know that, right? We need to come up with new, we need to come up to a new understanding of when we talk about these C words, right? Collaboration is something we talk about in 2015. Like we haven't been teaching collaboration ever in education. That's, I, I love it when we're like, oh yes, well, you know, collaboration, creativity, communication. We need to teach these things. Like that's any different than anything we've ever done. The problem is, is our definition of that word needs to change. When we talk about collaboration, we're talking across space and time. Why are we setting up our online systems to mirror our physical ones? Just because I teach you in first period doesn't mean you need a first period class out there. What happens if you just happen to have me first period in the physical world, but out there you can be with first period, third period, and fifth period all learning together? Why, why do we mirror these things? Why, when we talk about creativity, we need to understand that in 2015, we talk about crea creativity, about sharing content with the world, not creating something for your teacher, not creating something to go on the wall. Do you remember when you went to school? If you made the bulletin board, that was like, wow. And then if you made the bulletin board in the hallway, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm never gonna get there again. You're teaching a generation that shares more photos through Facebook to the world, and we don't take advantage of it. In fact, we try to shut it down. We tell them they can't go there. What does it mean if we change education to understand that when we say create, we mean globally? And so I keep asking myself, how do we prepare them for a world without borders? when half the population is under the age of 25? And I think the answer is in this guy. If you've seen this video before, it's called The Lone Nut. A guy starting to dance, and here's the thing. You guys are gonna be leaving this conference, going back to your schools, dancing like this guy. <laughs> right, you're all jazzed up, you've learned new things, and what you need to do when you get back is find your first follower. Now the first follower is really important because all of a sudden, you're not a lone nut anymore. 
Once you have a follower, you become two. And notice how the lone nut embraces the first follower. The first follower can do no wrong. And the first follower starts calling to their friends. And all of a sudden, as the two sit there, more start to join. And two become three. And then three become five. And all of a sudden, you go back from a conference, and instead of trying to change the entire system, can you find one follower? Can one follower lead to three followers? When you leave this conference, can you go back to your school and find the first follower and say, I have this crazy idea. Would you like to do it with me? When we talk about grassroots systems, this is what we're talking about. That all of a sudden there becomes a tipping point, and you, you've seen this in your schools, when all of a sudden you were on the outside, and if you stay on the outside, all of a sudden you're the outcast. <laughs> That if you don't join the movement, something else happens. Now, there's been a lot, there's been a lot ri written about this movement. The magic number is 27%. Crossing the Chasm, the book Crossing the Chasm, fantastic book. You need 27% to cross the chasm. As soon as you hit that tipping point, you cannot stop it. You have started something new that will change and take hold within a corporation or a company but it goes back to a lone nut. As you leave this conference, are you going to be the lone nut in your school? And how can you find your first follower? And being a lone nut is really, really difficult because a being a lone nut means that you understand that you're probably going to have to fail fast and fail loud. Now, I got this quote from my friend who works at Amazon. He works in the secret part of Amazon, which really frustrates me, because I don't know what he does at Amazon. But I asked him, I said, how do you run your project? He says, we live by this. Fail fast, fail loud. He's like, and every day we fail, and every day we celebrate those failures. We talk about them. We talk about what went right, what went wrong. We look at failure as a way forward, not a way back. And I thought, what happened if schools were that way? What happens if we could get teachers willing to go back and be a lone nut and fail beautifully? Thank you for coming to Learning 2. Thank you for a great conference. Have a great social and safe travels home.